Good morning. Welcome to the webinar this morning for school districts and those in the education sector. I'm Melissa Azalian Kenny, and we'll go ahead and get started in just one moment. Hey, we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. So good morning to everyone. It's nice to be with you this morning. My name is Melissa Azalea Kenny. I'm an attorney here at Byrne Foreman and I lead the firm's immigration practice. Today we are doing our annual school district webinar for those in the education sector, um, both clients and others. So we appreciate you joining us. If you are not in the education sector, this webinar is probably not going to be most appropriate for you, but we are doing another webinar today at 11 o'clock on business immigration issues for those not in the immigration sector, in the education sector. So if you are signed up for the wrong webinar, please feel free to go ahead and email me at makenny at burr.com, and I'd be happy to send you the link for the 11 a.m. Eastern webinar. But if you are in the education sector, you are in the right place. Um, we have lots to talk about today. I know that many districts are gearing up for their hiring activity and 23-24 um, school year. So you're thinking about things like maybe renewing contracts or hiring additional people to your district. Maybe you're thinking about some immigration sponsorships. So today we're going to talk about um, all things related to education and school districts and immigration. Um, we're going to talk about some key immigration principles. We'll talk about some timing considerations and make sure that you're ready to successfully start the school year. We do have a Q&A um, section that you should be seeing on your screen. So if you do have questions as I go along, please feel free to um, put those in the Q&A section and I'll be happy to address those. You also can email me after the webinar at makenny.bro.com and I'd be happy to um, send you a copy of the PowerPoint as well. All right, so with that, I know there's a lot of information on this slide, but the big takeaway here is that we have teacher shortages in South Carolina. And I know that's probably one of your main interests in today's topic. Um, we keep up to date you know, in our practice on these statistics because sometimes it's helpful um, in various arguments that we're making to really have some good statistics on teacher shortages and maybe explain why a teacher, for example, is needed back into the U.S. in a very short period of time. So one of those reports, if you haven't seen it, is the Sarah report. Um, you know, I think it does come out annually or perhaps every other year, but you can see here that one of the things that Sarah is tracking is how the number of vacancies is moving from year to year in public school districts. And you can see in 2022-2023 school year that they had a 39% increase in vacancies. So a lot of people are either moving out of the education sector or not pursuing you know, jobs in that area. I'm not sure what, but that's a pretty big increase in vacancies. Now, the next bullet point does talk about some of the things that the State Department of Education is doing. I mean, they do have a statewide recruitment and retention initiative. Perhaps some of you have benefited from that or you, you have information about that. Um, that initiative talks about really targeting maybe teachers from neighboring districts in North Carolina um, who might wanna move into South Carolina, also increasing the pay for teachers. So, um, there's been some advocacy for that and actually a big jump in 35% increase in starting salaries for teachers um, 
you know, in the, in the past eight years. So you can see the statistics there on the screen. The bottom portion of the screen talks about critical need areas, and there's actually a, a South Carolina statute, I've put the, the citation there at the bottom, where the State Board of Education designates various critical need subject areas and geographic areas on an annual basis. And I've also looked at that list and have looked at it from time to time, and a lot of the petitions that we're filing in the immigration sector in the immersion um, area all, at all grade levels, special education, sometimes math and science petitions, you know, those are all listed in this critical need subject areas. Um, and I found that, that again, that list valuable in my practice because many times we'll have teachers that will travel abroad and they'll need to come back quickly. And to be able to say that this is a critical need area in the state and the teachers need it back very quickly, you know, is, is a good strategy. So immigration can certainly be one solution to the teacher shortage problem. I know that it's not the only one. And, and I've, you know, I know that there's a lot of initiatives going on, but it is, it is one thing that a district can consider if you're experiencing some of these teacher shortages. And you have a couple of different options, and I've laid those out here on the screen. Um, one is that you know certainly you can use the J1 teacher program working through a third party sponsor. And I know that a lot of districts do that. And that program is, is an option. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Some other options might be to consider students, those students um, attending college and university here in the US and maybe graduating would still be in what we call F1 student status but they're eligible for a 12 month period of what we call optional practical training, which allows them to work for any employer as long as they're working in a field that's related to their study. Um, sometimes they can get even get that OPT period extended beyond 12 months. <clears throat> so F1 students are another option. And then the last option is the H1B sponsorship. That could be sponsoring your existing employees. Maybe they're already in J or F and you're going to sponsor them now for H1B. That might be hiring teachers from abroad and sponsoring them directly for H-1B status. We've done some of that for districts. Or that could be hiring teachers from other school districts who already have H-1B status, bringing them to your district and then sponsoring them for H-1B. So those are all available immigration options to districts. <clears throat> this graphic here just kind of explains sort of in a flow chart way the typical immigration path for a teacher. Normally they're either on J1 or F1. If the district's utilizing that, they then can transition to H1B and many times they transition to a green card. So before we dig into some of the specifics about the visas and the green cards, I thought it would be good to just go through some key immigration concepts, documents, things that um, might be helpful for you to know as you're working through this process. And I think when we think about immigration, think about it in two buckets, if you will, non-immigrant visas and immigrant visas. Non-immigrant visas are those that are sort of a temporary strategy where the person is coming to the U.S. just for a limited purpose. Their intent is to remain here for that designated per period and purpose and then go home. Um, and so one example, examples of those would be the F1, the J1, the H1B. It's sort of alphabet soup, to be honest. That's how sort of non-immigrant visas are, um, are captured. They're, they're alphabet uh, uh, numbers, letters in the alphabet is what I'm trying to say. Letters in the alphabet that the, that the immigration office assigns to these various categories. Some visas are dual intent. And what that means is that the person can have a temporary intent to come to the U.S., but at the same time, they can have a permanent intent, which is where we would sort of look at the green card strategy. So an example of a dual intent visa would be the H-1B. Immigrant visas, on the other hand, are those where somebody's seeking a permanent, more of a long-term strategy. They want to live in the U.S., live and work in the U.S. indefinitely. And... Um, a lawful permanent resident is the same thing as a green card holder, is the same thing as an immigrant visa holder. Um, many times when you're sponsoring somebody for a green card, 
it does require you to test the U.S. labor market and show there are no qualified U.S. applicants, which we will go ahead and talk about that a little bit later as well. Some of the key documents that you need to be aware of that we would be asking um, you for and that you probably would in turn be maybe at some point collecting from the foreign national or we would be collecting it would be um, their passport. And that's nothing other than an identity document. It just indicates who somebody is and what country they're from and whether there's a validity date on the passport. We are always keeping track of the expiration of the passport especially if the validity is less than six months. If that's the case, um, there are times when we can experience some issues with somebody filing a petition or particularly traveling um, out of the U.S. and trying to re-enter. Another document is the visa, and that's something that somebody obtains from a U.S. embassy or consulate abroad. You can't apply for a visa in the U.S. It has to be done at one of these consular posts abroad. And normally it's the person's home country or their country of last residence. Um, the visa will indicate the type. So you can see on this visa, it's a J-1. It will indicate um, you know, the, the date it was issued, the date it expires. And then sometimes it has some annotations there at the bottom. All that a visa really tells us is the period during which somebody can attempt to enter the US. It does not tell us how long somebody can stay just tells us like in this particular case, this, this gentleman could try to enter the US sometime between the period of July 7th, 2017 and June 30, 2018. What tells us how long somebody can stay is what we call an I-94 admission record. And if any of you have been in the immigration arena for a while, you'll know that the right-hand side of the screen is sort of the old I-94. Used to be a paper card attached in the passport. It had an admission date and an expiration date. And so that's what it looked like. It had some numbers and the name and, and the date of birth. They've now moved to an electronic system and that's the left side of the screen. So it's the very same document. It's just now maintained electronically at, um, along with a travel record. And you can see on this I-94, it indicates the class of admission. In this case, it's F1. The expiration date, which in this case is D slash S, which means duration of status. And then the details of the person would be listed here. So we're always interested in knowing when does somebody's I-94 expire? Because that tells us a lot about when we might need to file a case or even if we can file a case. Uh, maybe somebody's is expired or something. So that's the I-94. Now, once a petition is filed um, with the immigration office, which is um, we file with the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS, we get various correspondence from the immigration agency. And this is an example of that type of correspondence. Most of the receipts and approvals are issued on what's called the I-797 notice. You can see that in the top, um, like let's say on the right-hand side of the screen, the top left, the I-797. And at the bottom of the 797 is actually an I-94. So it looks a little different than this one on the left, but it really is the very same thing, the bottom portion. So again, it's telling us how long can this person stay in the U.S.? and what is their status. So in this case, the person is an H-1B and they can stay until 9-25-2021. And this of course is an example of a green card. They do change the look and some of the things on the green card, the various categories from time to time, but this is an accurate representation of um, the current green card. All right, we're gonna start with J-1 visas. And the first thing that I wanna mention is that most of the time, we do get questions from school districts sometimes about, can I be my own J-1 sponsor? And to be a J-1 sponsor is a very, it's a very long and detailed application. You have to be bringing, you know, a certain number of people over um, to your district or to, to the, to the, through the sponsor. So I, you know, I don't know of any districts um, that are J-1 sponsors. Most of them work through third parties and they serve, the district serves as the host employer. 
typically um, one of the categories in a J1 situation is a teacher. There are also other categories. There are research scholars, there are physicians, um, there are, um, or foreign medical graduates, I guess I should say, there are students, but we're talking about teachers today. And when a teacher gets a J1, they're typically issued what's called a DS 2019 by the third party J1 sponsor. That document has a lot of imp important information. It has who the sponsor is, it has who the, um, usually has the who the host employer is. It has their position um, or their title, you know, their title, the field that they're going to be working in. It has some dates on it. So it has, you know, dates ranging from their beginning of their J1 to the end of their J1. It also at the bottom, um, you know, has some interesting information, which we'll look at in a moment about whether they might be subject to a two year home residency requirement. But essentially, that is the governing document for a J1 visa holder. And typically, the J1 can remain um, in the US um, for up to five years. And what you might see is successive DS 2019s that are issued by the sponsor getting that person all the way up to the five year maximum. Many times, a third party sponsor will require districts and the teacher to sign agreements. So it is important to review this very carefully um, because those do govern, at least from that particular sponsor, the relationship that they have with the parties. One of the things that I wanna talk about next is the two-year home residency requirement. And not all J-1 visa holders are subject to that, but some are. And I think from a district perspective, it's important to be able to identify as best as you can who might be subject to that residency requirement. Now, what is this requirement? You know, in a nutshell, what it really is saying is that if a teacher's coming from a country where their skills are in a short supply and they're going to come over here on a J-1, the idea is when they finish that J-1, they would go back to their country and take those skills. And they would have to do that for a two-year period. So there's a document called the Exchange Visitor Skills List. And that's kind of what we look at to figure out, is this person likely going to be subject to the two-year home residency requirement? Now, why do we want to know that? Well, if the person wants to stay beyond the J-1 period, maybe they want to go to an H-1B, maybe they want to get a green card, we have to deal with this two-year residency requirement by either having them fulfill it, go back to their country for two years, or by getting it waived. Um, the most common waiver is what we call the no objection waiver. It typically is filed by the teacher. Um, it does take some time. It's a three-step process. The teacher starts with their embassy. The petition then goes to the Department of State and ultimately ends up in the immigration office. So as we're working on maybe an H-1B case, you know, we're always zeroing in on, is this teacher subject to the two-year requirement? And do they have a waiver of that requirement, for example? Um, or maybe they fulfilled that requirement. Maybe they've gone home for two years and they've been back in the country for you know, a long period of time. So it is an important assessment. This is sort of another place that you can look. In addition to that exchange visitor skills list that I mentioned, this is another place that you can look to make an initial assessment as to whether somebody is subject. On their visa, on the left-hand side, sometimes it will say bearer is subject to INA 212E, two-year-old does apply. Or on their DS-2019 on the bottom left, there are some boxes checked. I will tell you, sometimes these are wrong. So this is not always to be relied upon. Um, the best thing to do is probably get with your counsel and, and check that skills list together. But these are some initial assessments you can make if you happen to have these documents. <clears throat> and many times the teacher will know, you know, if they are subject to the two-year requirement. All right, the next thing I wanna cover is the H-1B visa. And this is called the specialty occupation visa. And most teaching positions are going to qualify as specialty occupations. And that's because they require a job um, that would typically require at least a bachelor's degree in a specific field. And most of the time, you know, teaching positions would, would fall into that category. Sometimes we get questions about teaching assistant positions. 
If that job doesn't typically require a bachelor's degree in a specific field or higher, then it's probably not going to qualify. An H-1B visa is employer specific, so it's not transferable to another employer. So if you decide to sponsor a teacher for an H-1B, they can't take that visa and move over to another district without sponsorship by that district. They are portable though. Okay, so there's a concept called H-1B portability. And what that rule says is unless the teachers violated their status or worked without authorization, they can move to another district. And once that district files their petition, they can start working. So they don't need to wait for approvability. So that's a rule that's been around for a while. And it's you know sometimes helpful if you need someone to immediately begin working. The H-1B is a six-year maximum. We apply in three-year increments that can be extended if you have a pending green card application. Don't forget that time in the H-1B is cumulative for all employers. So if somebody's coming into your district from District A and they work there for two years in H-1B and they arrive at your district, District B, then they would only have four years in H-1B. So um, that's important that we track that and know cumulatively how much time have they spent in H-1B. Just a reminder too, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and put them in the Q&A box as I'm going along. And now I'm going fast, but we, I do have a lot of information I wanna cover with you. All right, so what are some of the benefits of the H-1B? It is a good option to continue employment of the J-1 teacher beyond the fifth year. Um, there's nothing in the law that says somebody in any immigration status you know, can't stay in the United States. There's nothing that says that in the immigration regulation. So if a district likes a teacher and they want to continue to um, keep that teacher, then the immigration rules would not prevent H-1B sponsorship. Typically, what I see happening is if there is going to be a sponsorship, it's after the person has fulfilled their fifth year in the J-1 status, assuming they're coming in on the J-1. Um, there is no home residency requirement, so that's positive. And there are some options for family members. They um, would be in the U.S. in the H-4 category. Now, one downside to the H-4 is that the spouse cannot usually work. They can't attend school. They can work if you as the district sponsor them for a green card and you're at a certain point in the process. Um, and when we talk about the green card a little bit more, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more in depth. <clears throat> so if you're thinking about doing some H-1B sponsorships, there are some initial considerations that um, you know I might recommend that I think would be helpful. One would be to certainly create a list of your potential sponsorships. You know, normally that would be looking within your district to see if you have teachers maybe already on H-1B that need extensions, or if you have people on F-1 or J-1 status that are appropriate for sponsorship, you know, you might create a list of those sponsorships. And some of the initial things that would be helpful to look at would be their licensure status, what their education credentials are, certainly their visa status. And if they are a J-1, whether they're subject to the two-year home residency issues. Those are all things that our team will be working with the district on as well. But I think it helps if a district kind of does some of those initial assessments as well. You do want to understand the teacher's um, approaching expiration date. And how would you know that? You know, one way you might know that would be looking at their I-9 form, you know, every teacher that's hired is going to fill that out when they onboard with you. And so they might be presenting documents that would show you that. Um, maybe if you do some J1s, you know, you have a centralized spot where you keep all of the DS 2019s. So it kind of depends on your system. But for J1 teachers, what we're always keeping an eye on is when their DS 2019 expires. Because for the H1B, we have 30 days from that expiration to file that petition. Usually they expire on or around June 30 at the end of the school year. And then we can file the petition, you know, within that grace period. We certainly can file it before that. But that's kind of our outlying time period to file. For an F1 student, 
they have a document very similar to um, the J1 and it's called the I-20. And that also has very similar information. It would list an expiration date and they have a 60 day grace period during which we could file. And then for an H-1B teacher, if they're with your district, you know, we're looking at when their I-94 expires. If they're coming from another district, we're really looking at maybe what the termination date is at that district, because that could indicate when we have to file our petition uh, for the new district. Another thing that you want to look at is, um, do you qualify for cap exemption? And I, I don't have a lot of slides on this today because my experience is that most public school districts are going to apply for what we or are going to qualify for what we call the H-1B cap exemption. But the quick summary of this is that not it, there are some employers that have to file for H-1B petitions on March 1st of every year or April 1st, April 1st of every year. Excuse me, March 1st, March 1st, March 1st of every year in a lottery system. So it's coming up. And um, they buy for a limited number of H-1B spots. And if they get one of the spots, they can sponsor the person. If they don't, then they can't. So school districts kind of have a unique position um, in that if they have an affiliation with an institution of higher education, a college or university, they can then qualify for a cap exemption. So they have to be a public school district and they have to have this affiliation. Most of the time they have it through either a dual enrollment agreement or a student teaching agreement. So in a dual enrollment agreement, for example, the student would be maybe taking high school courses at ABC district, but they might be doing that through a local community college and therefore they're getting college credit. So that's the dual enrollment. And because the district and the college have an agreement, a written agreement permitting that program, that qualifies them for cap exemption. So it's a very, um, it's very good. And what that means is that we can file an H-1B petition at any time during the year. We're not vying for one of those limited spots. Um, that wasn't always the case. I mean, maybe, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, maybe 10 years ago, this rule came into play. But it's helpful for districts who need to fill positions, you know, throughout the year. The other thing that you want to look at is, has there been an offer and acceptance of employment? Um, sometimes we will get a referral from a district and we'll reach out to the teacher, but maybe they really haven't been offered the job or haven't been accepted the job. There's discussions between the district and the teacher, but no, no formal offer and acceptance. So that's one thing that we want to make sure that is done you know, before we're getting involved or where you really are talking about immigration. That's just a safe course of action. The other thing you want to think about is fees. You know, who is going to pay the attorney fees, the filing fees? What about for the family? Who's going to pay for the family? That's always a question. And what about premium processing? That's sort of the expedited um, avenue. Is that something that um, the district is going to pay for or will they allow the teacher to pay for that? Certification issues um, do come up in the immigration context, and the J-1 teachers, when they come in, they have an international certificate, but when a teacher moves to H-1B sponsorship, they can no longer have the international certificate. They must obtain an initial certificate working through the SCDOE. Um, usually, F-1 teachers can also obtain that initial certificate. So, you know, normally what we see is the district and, and certainly our office we, you know, sort of counsel the teacher to go ahead and make those early connections with SCDOE to find out, you know, what they need to be doing for certification. Um, sometimes there are praxis exams that need to be taken maybe in a different content area than they were expecting. There are also timing considerations. So those are things that early on are helpful to um, establish open communication lines with SCDOE and, and make sure you know you know, what is needed and the teacher knows what is needed. Sometimes the teacher um, maybe can't obtain the licensure. So there are some different um, options here. One is the letter of agreement strategy. This is sort of an alternative that we've used from time to time where a teacher might be coming into work for a limited period of time. They're supervised by another certified teacher. 
<clears throat> and we're gathering documents to kind of show that, you know, they're going to be working for this temporary period of time on that letter of agreement while maybe they're working on packet, passing a practice, praxis or something like that. There's also the PACE program. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. And we do have teachers that are enrolled in that and that does work for H-1B status. Um, the other thing that we might as an alternative get if somebody's not in PACE or not doing a letter of agreement is we will work with the, the um, South Carolina Department of Education for a letter. And they will give us a letter that says all of the requirements for certification have been met except for the H-1B. And that letter can then be used to apply for the H-1B. So when you're thinking about H-1B sponsorship, one of the things that comes up as well is the wage of the teacher. And you know, I know that all districts, at least in South Carolina public, um, you know, operate from a salary schedule, or at least I think they all do. That's what I've seen. So, you know, you have your salary schedule that you're looking at internally to make sure the teacher is slotted in at the appropriate wage based on their credentials. The immigration office says the district has to pay the teacher the higher of the actual or the prevailing wage. Now, the actual wage is kind of what other teachers in your district doing similar work are being paid doesn't mean you have to pay your sponsored teacher that amount, but sometimes we need to kind of explain, um, you know, why our teacher might be a little bit lower. Maybe they have a bachelor's and the other candidates have a master's, for example. The prevailing wage is the market wage. The Department of Labor um, sets that. And so, you know, what we're looking at and filing the case is what you want to pay the teacher and how that wage kind of meshes with some of these other um, principles that we have to keep an eye on. And we'll let you know, you know, if there's an issue. The other thing you should know is H-1B costs and expenses are deemed employer business expenses. So if you require the employee to pay for any portion of the cost of the H-1B, that can be viewed sometimes as a deduction from their wage. It's not actually deducted, but it's seen as a deduction. And so sometimes you can run afoul of the DOL rules. Most of the time, what I'm used to seeing is the district is paying for the employee to be sponsored for the H-1B and they're, they're paying those costs. Okay, when do you need to notify counsel? Um, these, are, these are helpful touch points for us. Sometimes we find these things after the fact and um, you know we're just doing some cleanup work. So thought it would be good just to kind of lay this out. So if you are going to lay off or furlough an H-1B teacher, that would be something that would be helpful to know because we may, we would want to terminate that teacher's H-1B status. If we don't do that, even if you lay them off, you could still be on the hook for paying their wage. So we really just need to terminate the petition. If they change in duties, maybe they have a material change in duties. You know, they're moving from... Um, a material change could be, you know, moving, let, let's just say from science or math to special education. You know, those are uh, two different content areas and they fall within different occupational categories. If they change work locations, maybe they start <clears throat> doing some remote work. <clears throat> that is something that does require some updating of the file. If you reduce their wage, then what we've stated, that's another red flag area. And certainly if you terminate them, there are some, some notification requirements. Um, one thing that's important to know is if it's an involuntary termination by the district. Um, so, you know, we decide to fire somebody before the H-1B period ends. There is a provision of the law that says that you have to pay the one economy airline ticket for their return transportation home. Um, now, if they go work for another district, if they stay in the U.S., you know, you don't have to pay that. But if they truly are going to go home, then that is something that you may have to pay. It doesn't come up a lot, but it is it is in the regulations. So this is good news. Currently, H-1Bs are only taking two and a half to three months for approvability. That is very good compared to what we see on some of these other types of cases that we're filing. Um, so that's that's, you know, good news. That could change, you know, as we enter into sort of a heavier filing season, that can change. Usually it's four to five months. 
Um, if you want a decision in 15 days, 2,500 filing fee for that for premium processing. You can file H-1B extension petitions up to six months before their expiration. So that is very, very um, helpful. So if you are, um, you know, if you know which teachers you have that are in H-1B that might need an extension and they're expiring, let's say in June or July or August, I mean, those petitions can be filed now. So that, that kind of helps you as a district maybe spread out your sponsorships. If you're going to have some new hires coming in in April or May, maybe get your extensions handled, you know, now so that you can get those out of the way. Did want to talk a little bit about family options because those, that, those questions do come up. And one thing to know is if, if the teacher is a J1 and they do get a waiver, that does apply to the dependents as well. Um, and so the dependents are in what we call H4 status. That's, that's something that you know, we would transition them to. And that could be a spouse or any child under the age of 21. We're always looking at children to see if they're aging out. In other words, during the time that we're filing this petition, are they going to reach the age of 21? And if they are, then sometimes we'll even file like two different petitions for the children and the spouse, because if we file everybody under the same case, then they cut everybody's um, they cut everybody's expiration off at the same time. So that's that's one thing you need to know about the age four. The other thing that's a new development, really exciting, is now the immigration office is adjudicating the family petitions at the same time as the H one B petition. This is based on some litigation that's been longstanding, and what we were seeing before is it was taking a year to get the family approved. So it's frustrating for the family. Um, they're always checking in on, you know, what, what's the status of my case? So now what you should see is the H-1B petition approved and very close in time, you should see the family case approved too. So that is very good news. I did mention before that the H-4 cannot work unless the district's done a green card for the H-1B and they have an approved I-140. International travel is something else I wanted to mention. Um, if you, it, I know it's difficult and sometimes you don't get information, but the more that you can know about travel abroad plans for your teachers, the better, because especially if they're, you know, in between maybe getting an, uh, an H-1B extension or they're going to be changing status from J to H, sometimes their travel abroad can impact that. Um, if they do travel abroad, remember they have to have the visa that we talked about earlier to get back into the US. So planning ahead and gathering some of those documents are important. There may be interviews required and you know we can advise the teacher and look at sort of where they're going and what the delay might be, um, what documents they might need. Many of them are familiar with this as well and you know we'll do their own independent investigation, but um, being sensitive to travel and, and knowing how that intersects with what you're doing or the, in terms of sponsorship is helpful. All right, do you want to talk about green cards for a moment? So <clears throat> you remember the flow chart in the beginning, you kind of have maybe the J1 or the F1, you then move to the H1B, and if a district wants to pursue a longer term strategy for the teacher, the green card might be an option. There are typically three steps to the green card, and those are laid on this flow, laid out on this flow chart. The PERM labor certification is the first step, second step I-140, and the third step I-485 adjustment of status or consular processing. Um, if somebody's going to remain in the US, which is how most of this works during the process, they would be doing an I-485 adjustment of status at the third step. Now, when you get to the I-1, well, really when you start a case, when you start a case, you're figuring out whether the district, what, what category the district is going to file the case in. And those are based on employment-based categories or EB categories called one, two, and three. So most districts are going to file their green cards under the EB-2 or EB-3 process. And with that, most of them, them are going to be going through this PERM labor certification. 
Okay, so what is that really? And this is a very, I mean, this is a one-liner when it's really could be a presentation on that. But basically with PERM, what you're doing is you're testing the U.S. labor market to show that there are no qualified U.S. applicants. Different from the H-1B, you can hire who you want, you can sponsor anybody that you want. When you get to the green card, you can sponsor anybody you want, but you have to make sure that you go out and test the labor market and demonstrate there are no minimally qualified U.S. applicants. Now, when do you decide whether you should pursue the green card for a teacher? We would recommend that you begin that no later than the fourth year of your cumulative H-1B status. And the reason for that is that you may be able to extend their status beyond the sixth year, but you have to have the green card process in place well enough in advance to be able to do that. So um, the example is probably the easiest uh, situation here. So Randy starts working for XYZ District in H-1B status on January 1st, 2020. He moves to ABC on January 1st, 2023. He works for ABC and his H-1B status expires on December 31st, 2025. So we right away know Randy is getting close to, you know, we, we know that on December 31st, 2025, Randy's going to hit his sixth year of H-1B. So in order to extend Randy's H-1B beyond that, the recommendation would be to begin the process for Randy in 2023, which would be his fourth year of H-1B but no later than 2024, which would be his fifth year of H-1B. Now, why do we say begin that early? It takes a while to be able to file that first step, that perm in the green card. Um, right now, it's taking almost a year for the prevailing wages to come back. So if you're doing this as a district, you know that already, but um, just be aware that there are some time delays. So kind of coming in at the beginning of the sixth year and saying, we got to do a green card, probably isn't going to work because the time frames are so backlogged. So fourth year, maximum fifth year would be a good time to consider this for green card sponsorship. One of the things that's important as well to know as well is what are the green card backlogs? And that's determined by looking at what's called the visa bulletin. I listed the link here at the bottom. Um, it comes out monthly. And what it tells you is how quickly the immigration office is moving through um, green card cases. And the way that they look at a teacher's case moving through the process is when is the perm filed, the first step. So the day that first step is filed, that establishes what's called a priority date. And that's gonna tell us by looking at this bulletin, how quickly is somebody likely to move through the system? One thing you should know is that there are huge backlogs for Indian nationals particularly, and some backlogs for Chinese nationals. Why is that? There's a 7% per country cap on green cards. So people from those countries utilize green cards a lot. Therefore, the backlogs creep up. Okay, so the last thing I wanna cover is just kind of some, I guess, case management type of comments. and. These apply to the, you know, the I-9 process applies to all hires, but they also, are, it's also a very important document for, for national hires because sometimes you're needing to update that. So one thing um, that I'd mentioned here on the first bullet point is, you know, having a good immigration portal or some sort of immigration system that you keep or your council keeps to manage your expiration and manage your activity is very helpful. Um, that portal can be used to request new cases. So, you know, we have a portal that we work with clients on and clients can request new cases through that portal as opposed to emailing us. It's just a, a very easy way for them to communicate with us. We have a new case. They can upload key documents. The employee can upload key documents through the portal as well. So that kind of keeps everything very, um, you know, compact and related to that employee in one central spot. The other thing that it can be helpful for, for you as a district is you can see your case activity. So the way, and the way you typically would do that is look at a report that maybe the system would run for you. I had a district check-in, actually it wasn't a district, it was another non-education client check-in and they said, do you know who we have on H-1B? 
You know, they don't, they didn't know. Do you know who we have on H1B? So we can kind of run a report through that system and show them here are the people, here are their expirations, here's whether we've started a green card. So it's just a good management tool to help you keep track of, you know, kind of what's coming up and what's going on with the cases. The other thing kind of related to that in terms of good documentation is once you get an approval, updating your I-9 form is important. So normally you're going to record an update in section three. Maybe you would attach like a new I-9 form with section two to your existing I-9 form, but you know, you can be audited. So it's always good to take a pause, think about whether you've ever done an I-9 audit and maybe look at your records and, and update them if you need to. Um, if you're hiring a foreign national for the first time, that also is a little bit of a tricky situation in terms of completing that I-9. So that's something too that you wanna make sure you have somebody in your team assigned to. It's kind of managing that because it's gonna look a little different than maybe the driver's license and the social security card that maybe you're used to getting for other candidates. All right. And that is all that I have for today. So about 9.45, I do have time for some questions. Um, if anybody has anything, go ahead and enter it in the Q&A. Let me look and see if I see anything here. I don't. All right. So maybe I answered everything. Um, but I appreciate your time today. And I know that a lot of questions are very specific. So please feel free to email me. I'm happy to respond back with anything that you might need to know. But I hope the hiring season goes well and uh, look forward to talking soon. Thanks for joining us today.